The Parent and Family Resource Introduction to Ethics and Morality This presentation is an introduction to ethics and morality, including definitions and examples related to the parent and family resource, how ethics creates equality in relationships and can help us to learn about love in relationships with ourselves and others. Morality is what is loving, right and wrong, from God's perspective. Recorded in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia, on the 5th of March, 2021, at 8.30am, Session 1. Hello and welcome to the Parenting Principles Program. I'm Eloisa. This presentation will focus on ethics and morality, giving a brief well, definition and then a sort of a brief introduction to these concepts. As the program's main focus is on love and growing in love, and which includes being truthful and honest, and also, um, as I mentioned in previous videos, having a relationship with God is the fastest way in order to learn about love. You don't have to do it um, with God, but I have to say for myself personally, I found that a lot harder and a lot slower um, to do it on my own. In saying that, you might start out um, without a relationship with God, just focusing on love and truth principles and things like that. Ethics is a way to measure how, um, whether something is loving or not, and it's a quite simple. And when you're first starting out in what I refer to as my, the clueless stage, that's how it felt to me, ethics was a go-to in order to figure out whether I was being loving or not. It's like a quick reference point and you can apply it to situations across the board. So let's begin with a definition. So to define ethics, I've just written it up on the, um, on the whiteboard as well, so you can have a little look. And to define, I'm going to read the definition out because I want it to be um, specific. So the definition of ethics is acting in harmony with natural love of all humans. In other words, treating others as you would like to be treated yourself. Taking into consideration love of self, others, creatures, and the natural environment, ethics creates equality between humans. That's the definition I'm using. It's taken from a God's Way um, volunteer selection program outline, and there'll be a link that you can um, check that, that out if you're interested. In a nutshell, it's really treating others as you'd like to be treated. That means not necessarily how you're being treated or the way you are currently treating people, but how you'd like to be treated. So for example, if someone you know, punched you in the nose, you probably wouldn't like that very much. That means when you then have the impulse or the impetus to punch someone else in the nose, you need to think like, well, would I like that? No, okay, probably it's out of harmony with love. I'm not going to do it. And then you can work through without taking the action of punching someone in the nose while you feel like you really, really want to. It is still important to discover the reason and what's motivating you and what is pushing you in order to behave in certain ways. Because remember, this program is about learning about love and learning about yourself and what you really feel and what you really think and becoming very truthful and honest about what, what is going on inside of your soul and inside of you. And your soul, your thoughts and your feelings are a reflection of what's happening inside of your soul. So they're very important to understand and know what to do. Now, in regards to children, because this is about parenting, their ethics applies in everything you do. So often we treat children a lot worse than we'd actually treat other adults or, or ourselves. We think that we can get away with a lot more, or that it doesn't matter if we treat children in a certain way, or we have some quite distorted beliefs, I feel, about children. Sometimes we, we actually treat children far better than we might treat, treat ourselves or others as well. It just depends on um, your own injuries, I suppose, that emotional injuries that you've grown up with and your belief systems and things. So, for instance, sometimes children are treated like little royalty and they're given everything they want, you know, and, and then when they get demanding and they throw, chuck a tantrum, you give them more. And, you know, when you chuck a tantrum, you know, maybe you expect to get it too. So I suppose in that way it's ethics, but that's not loving. So ethics does have its limitations because sometimes you might feel like it's loving. For example, you might feel it's loving or and you might like it when someone commiserates with your 
emotions. Say you're very afraid of something, you feel like, yeah, it's right that someone makes me, like takes away my fear and makes me feel less afraid and makes it so that I don't have to experience any discomfort in my emotional expression and things like that. And, you know, you might feel that, like, yes, that's, that's right that they do that. And you also might feel, yeah, and it's right that I do that for others and that I like that. So in that sense, you'd be being ethical, but it's not loving. And that's where morality comes in. So the definition that I have described for, for morality is treating others, ourselves, and all of creation in harmony with God's love. Morality is a standard or a code which helps us understand what is good and evil, loving and unloving from God's perspective. Now, it's hard to have morality if you don't have a relationship with God and you don't understand what is moral and what, what isn't. In saying that, I do, have a, like, I do feel that most people, if not all, have some sense of what is right and wrong inside of their soul. Now, we over time might deny that and shut it down and not listen to it and not act upon it. But often when I speak to people, or, and kids particularly, when you say certain things, they can see, like they go, yeah, I can see that that wasn't a very kind thing to do. So I have this feeling like we do have certain uh, moral feelings about things, even when you don't have a relationship with God, or, and sometimes we do. I feel like we, our, the conscience helps us to see certain truths, even when we might be clueless about the theory or different things. You know, in our, in our hearts, we know like it's wrong to murder another person. And that's unethical and immoral to take another's life. I feel quite strongly that we do have a sense of what is right and wrong. I feel that we often override that or over time we end up um, yeah, just desensitizing to that and then acting on what we want to do out of our own addictions, meaning physical or spiritual or emotional addictions that we use in order to avoid certain feelings. But I do feel we have a sense of morality inside of us on certain issues, not on all, but on certain ones. But to become, I think, a fully moral person, I, like I know for me, there were certain things that I felt were ethical that I found they're not moral. And it is via the relationship with God that I've realized like, well, hold on, this isn't loving. And, I, and for me personally, I really want to love as God loves. And I want to know what is good and evil from God's perspective, not my own. And so that has caused me to go on to a discovery of figuring out, well, hold on, how does this relate and how would God feel about this thing? And am I in harmony with God's morality or not? And that's something that's developing. I don't have mor morals in every area. I feel that my moral character is, is growing. Now, at first, I felt quite clueless about all of these things, and I definitely couldn't think about them. So in, ref in hindsight, I can see that there were certain things that, yes, I could say, yes, there were certain morals and uh, things that I upheld, and there were certain ethics that I upheld just um, without thinking about it. But it started to become something that I actively wanted to learn about and know and act on without having to try. So ethics was the way I began, and then, as I said, my relationship with God now is helping me to understand morality in a, in a far deeper way. But to begin with, you may just be at the ethics stage, and just a really easy way to see what's happening in the family and to sometimes make some you know, loving decisions and take lo more loving actions. And I don't think you can have more loving or less loving. It's, you either take loving actions or you don't, and you... Uh, are moral or you're not. It's, it's quite, you are or you're not. So in order to take loving actions, ethics is a place to start and it can help you to learn about yourself and where you're at and how ethical you really are in your family. So ethics is, the, is a go-to point for me in order to measure when I'm uncertain about if something's loving or not. It's just like the first port of call of like, okay, like say for instance, some things that happened with the children in, in, our, in my care when they were very young, I ended up, you know, sometimes feeling quite angry that they didn't do things fast enough. So I would yell and, and say, come on, get on with your stuff and do it louder than that. But I'd sometimes, if when I got afraid and they were interacting with something, I might pull them away, you know, kind of roughly. If they were just like in the middle of investigating something, I might just remove them quite quickly. And that was really to avoid my own fear. 
So if ethics, like I could actually go, all right, so if ethics was in play here, one, I don't like being hurried and yelled at in order to hurry up and get things done. So that helped me to measure going, well, yes, I don't like that. No, that isn't loving. I wouldn't. And when it happens to me, I feel quite upset about it, which the children also felt quite upset when, when I did that to them. And so I learned like, okay, no, instead of like yelling at them, if I want to yell and I want to try and make them, I'd stopped and I went, okay, I'm being unethical now. That means I'm not being loving. What is really going on for me? And then I was able to self-reflect on, wow, I just feel like I want them to hurry up. I just wanted them to do what I want them to do. And I found all kinds of different things that led me down a path of figuring out like all these beliefs that I had about, you know, children should get on and get and do things when I want them to. So it was really a demand from me upon them. And I could then see, hold on, no, not. And like I know as a principal, no demand or expectation is loving. So if I have a demand upon someone that they should do something, they should do it the way I want, when I want, how I want, right now, immediately, now I'm out of harmony with love. So I could then go, right, well, now I've got a demand. Okay, what's going on for me? Take it back to myself and work through that. Sometimes in the moment, like with the one with the fear that I um, was just describing, if I'd been more humble, meaning that I'd been prepared to feel more of my feelings in the moment, um, if they had been in serious danger, then there isn't a problem with removing your child from serious danger. But the fact that they're in that that, um, position in the first place is a sole attraction for me because I haven't dealt with my fear. So firstly, it's happening because of something inside of myself, which I need to look at. Secondly, if I was more humble, I wouldn't just like rip them out of out of the thing and project and dump all my fear on them. I would, you know, if I was humble, I'd feel all of that fear. And pr- depending on what the situation was, you know, probably they'd like leave the situation anyways. What I found later on happened if I actually owned that. Wow, I'm so terrified of that. They often just naturally got off and walked walked away. I feel like, say, if there was something else, I may that times I did just remove them from the situation and felt as I was doing it. The more that you feel in the moment, you let the feelings flow through you, the less projection there is out into your environment, the less the children are absorbing all of those things coming out of you, and that makes for a more loving space. So ethics is a place to start when you're just setting out on your, your discovery of what is love and what isn't love. And ethics is a wonderful tool in your arsenal if you like and I suppose the yeah I suppose the principle of ethics is to treat others as you'd like to be treated and that's a really easy thing to remember like would I like to be treated this way and you can easily measure that and you can do that in your partner relationships with children with friendships with all kinds of things now as I said just be aware that some things you will like that are happening in in ethics and you'll you will be ethical but you're not necessarily loving. And that's where morality is very important. And morality is God's perspective. So, you know, if we shorten that down, that definition that I was talking about, really it's, you know, what what God sees as loving and treating others in harmony with how God's perspective of what is loving. So that means, you know, what is good and evil? What is a sin and what is love? And these things are, until you get an education in love, you're not going to know, and that's an ongoing process. So it took, I know for myself, my own experience was, you know, the, at the beginning I really felt clueless about love, and I reflect back, and I wasn't as, um, it wasn't that I didn't have certain feelings about what was, say, right and wrong, good and evil, and all of those things, it's just that I was really desensitized to a whole lot of things and, and didn't feel um, connected to myself And because I was disconnected from my own, what I really felt, what I really thought, and I had a lot of judgment about my own feelings and my own thoughts, and I had a lot of fear of how other people would perceive me, and I had a lot of anger and all kinds of stuff that was in me that I was trying to avoid. So that made it quite a lot harder to really know what was one going on to what everything that was being reflected to me. And so it did take time for me to, you know, I put into practice these principles, I I applied ethics, I did all these things, but for me personally, it did take, you know, a while to work it out of like, okay, well, this is and this isn't. And sometimes it's, it can be quite confusing, like we had three children under two and a half, and when there's three different things happening, you know, you can't really intellectually figure it out. Well, I found it exceptionally hard to figure it out. 
And that's not what I'm encouraging here. I really am encouraging you to feel, feel it out. And the more that I began to feel things through, and when I say feel through things, you don't think about that. You just feel what you feel, again, in a self-responsible manner so that you're not taking it out on your children or your partner or anyone else. And in saying that, it might start out that you are doing all of these things. Remember, like in a previous video, I was talking about you need to measure and figure out where you're at. And if where you're at is that you want to hit your kids and you want to be angry at them and you want to blame them for everything that's happening in your life and you see their behavior as the problem and that there's nothing wrong with you, well, that's where you need to start. And that's not a loving place to be. And it's also, if you self-reflect on it, you're being really unethical because you're blaming everybody else in your environment for what's happening to you and what you're actually creating. So you're out of harmony with love now. You know, you can do these kind of things and you can measure these, but you, these um, where you're at, but you do need to be very honest with yourself. And a lot of the time, you come to see that you're not really a very nice person in certain areas. It doesn't mean that you can't be a nice person. It just means where you're at right now, you're not. And I, you know, for me, I know that in, still in certain areas, because I want certain addictions met or don't want to um, you know, uphold love under certain situations, well, in those situations and on those subjects, I'm not a very nice person. And I need to figure out why I don't want to love in those situations. Because as I said, you either love or you don't. That simple. And it's just, that's the simple with ethics. You're ethical or you're not ethical. You know, I, I suggest to suspend judgment. There's a number of things such as judgment, you know, self-attack, attacking others, blaming others. They're not helpful to your progress and to you actually working through your emotions and becoming this 100% emotional being. Those things are going to prevent your progress. Um, so I suggest working through them, which is an emotional process. You need to figure out why you want to judge. What does it give you? You know, why you want to get away from your emotional experience? What does that give you? What do you don't want to feel? What are you angry about? Where are your resistances? All these things will come into it. As far as parents and children, ethics is a way to go, okay, you know, and it's very good as an adult-child relationship because there's certain things, like, it's very sad, actually, that we are prepared to treat children worse often than we do adults. And some things that we'd never do out of the family, we do in the family. Like, sometimes, that, well, there are st statistically that family is actually one of the most abusive places and um, places to be in many situations. You know, there's, uh, our kids came home from school recently and they'd been taught about stranger danger. And I ended up having a conversation with them and saying, well, actually, you know, the statistics are more that someone you know is more likely to abuse you or harm you than someone who is a stranger. But there's this big sort of put on like, no, strangers are the danger. And I'm not saying from time to time, someone who you have no idea who they are just comes in and, you know, there's a violent crime or something happens. That does happen, absolutely. But the family, and I think we need to look more, um, you know, more realistically and more honestly at the family dynamic. And there's a lot of abuse that happens in families which is not being dealt with. So this is a start of a way to stop that happening and to create an opportunity for the next generation to have a different experience than you know, many of us have had. Also, you know, abuse I know is going to sound to some people like, oh, that's not how it is in my family. But my definition of abuse has changed over time. Like there are some very, very heavily abusive things that happen. So physical violence and abuse towards children or partners or anyone in a family, that's, that, that's you know, it's easy to see. No, that's very abusive. Sexual abuse of a child, like so an adult taking advantage of a child or even children sexually abusing each other, reflecting the sexual injuries of their parents and their emotion, the family dynamic, that is abuse. You know, it's quite clear cut. You can see, you know, that's, that's really wrong. And others, I suppose, you can morally say, no, that, that isn't right to do that. But there are other abuses that happen in families that people think are fine. And until you become sensitive to them, often we're not seeing them as abuse. So I see... Um, condescension and continuous pull downs and belittlement and jokes at a child's expense and in an or in an attempt to humiliate or ridicule them 
I see that as abuse, a form of abuse, because that's actually eroding a child's sense of them themselves. It's attacking their nature and their personality. It's telling them that there's something wrong with them. It's saying that they can make, you know, that that's okay to make fun of them in a nasty way. That's different if you love someone and you're just having some fun, you know, like saying things and there's a feeling of love from you. But I don't see that. And a lot of families are like, oh, what's your problem? And then when the child, you know, or the member of the family, because it might be a mum or a dad who also is under that, sometimes mums ridicule um, the dads, you know, their partner and pull them down and are quite unkind and can be very manipulative um, because they're not dealing with their anger. Or, you know, um, a dad and a man can do the same to a woman. So there's a lot of dynamics in a family. And the more sensitive I come, the more I'm I sensitive I get to like, well, no, if something is reoccurring over a long period of time and there's an intention to harm, pull down, um, make that person feel bad about themselves, manipulate them into doing things, all of that is abusive. And the more sensitive you come to feel about those things, you know, you'll feel, no, that's really, really morally wrong to do that, particularly to a child, when the child's done nothing to you. The child is just reflecting you and your partner and the, fa you know, the environment that it's in. So with your caregiver or, you know, any of those things, a child's just refl a reflector, particularly when it's like under the seven, you know, years of age and even a bit older than that. I, I, it's not a hard and fast rule. It's just that, like, you know, children are reflecting their environment. So as parents, you know, we're not being abused by our children. We're being abusive to them. Now, if a child, because there are some incidences that I've heard and I've been on the receiving end too of where children start hitting and being quite violent, like I've heard of um, certain mums being uh, physically attacked by their sons, you need to look how you got there and take responsibility that, for whatever reason, like one, you're very open to violence and there must have been something that's happened in your childhood or some belief you have or something that's going on where you're open to receiving that because a child has to learn how to be violent. And I also suggest that it doesn't just happen overnight. Usually there's lead up to these things happening. And if you have some humility in the sense of be very open and honest with yourself, allow yourself to feel what's really gone on and what you really feel, you'll be able to trace back to when these things started with a child and what was going on and what actions as a parent you didn't take in order to deal with that cause or that issue at when it happened. For a lot of parents, being told that, it, you know, that you, you are actually responsible for the behaviour that your child is acting out, particularly when they're young, is going to be quite confronting. And going from a place of blaming the child, which seems easier because you don't have to deal with your issues when you do that as a parent. So, you know, parents, by blaming children, parents can sort of overlook anything that's going on for them. And I'm saying in this um, program, no, you, the parent, are responsible for what is happening in your family. You are directly influencing these children. And it is your issue if there is an illness, an accident, you know, something that's happening, and I'm talking about, you know, so let's say under the age of 12, you have a collective thing, you know, you have actually partial responsibility in anything that happens to your child. For a lot of parents um, who I've spoken to, who, you know, I've been um, interacted with, and for myself when I first heard that, like, I was like, wow, that's a pretty big thing. Um, for me, I it made sense um, and I actually could see, yep, I can see, you know, and I experimented rapidly with that truth and went, okay, what's really happening in our family? Uh, my issue was that I thought it was all my problem and that I was the only one with the problem in the family. I have needed to work through certain things to see that, no, it was me and my ex-husband's issues. It was, you know, a, a collective of what was happening with the child both parents' influence on the child. The children are reflecting both parties in the relationship. Again, depending on the makeup of your family, if you're just a single parent and you have been, say, before the child was born, that child is going to have some um, inheritance things from its father. But as if you're a single mother, then you're going to have the majority of the influence upon that child and as it grows. In saying that, then, say, if uh, you 
you know, have a new boyfriend or whatever, and depending what age that boyfriend or has a new, new husband comes in, they, they are also going to have an influence on the child. If you have grandparents involved, so say both parents go, then the grandparents are also going to influence the child. So the adults in the environment, depending on the makeup of the family, which could be unique under all different situations, are going to influence the child and what's happening and what they reflect back. So I feel like that point, just in summary, is very, very important. So in summary, you as the parent have a responsibility and when your child is acting out, you absolutely are responsible for that behaviour, particularly when they are very, very young. As I have mentioned, as they get older, children start acting on their own choices. They start making their own choices, taking their own actions based on what has happened to them in their childhoods. But their choices then dictate whether they live in harmony or disharmony with God's laws. And this is a thing, regardless whether you believe in God, you're still under God's laws. Like God's laws are acting upon your soul no matter what, whether you believe in God or you don't believe in God, whether you don't want a relationship with God or you do. So knowing and understanding God's laws or universal law is very, very important for your own happiness, even if you want to develop and progress in natural love, which, as I said before, is that um, natural love in a human that comes from you towards another person or towards God. Also, God would love to receive our love. The natural love that you develop from your own efforts. As children grow older, then they're making a choice whether they want to develop that or to not, and you know, whether they want to be loving or unloving. So once they become, you know, in their late teenagers and they become adults, now they're acting and making choices on their own, out of their own heart and their, and their own decisions and they're still the influence of their childhoods there if they haven't like, worked through those issues and released a lot of things that, under an emotional process because the only real change is soul-based change. So if a child doesn't go through an emotional process and release what was done and you know how it feels about what happened in the, its child in the childhood, then they're going to act on all of those things as well. And so there is a partial responsibility in the parent for those things. So there's a lot of things that are going on between parents and children, even if you think they're not. I notice a lot of the time that as humanity we focus on physical things and not what's happening in the soul or between the soul dynamic. What I've learned over the last 11 years is that the soul conversation and what's happening in my soul is the most important thing. And spending time working through any issue or impediment that's out of harmony with love in my soul, that is the most effective time spent. Because when I actually make a soul-based change, there's many, many physical changes that happen. So, yeah, very, very important to, to understand that truth that if you, you know, only real change is soul-based change. And you can experiment with that and you can try it. And I really recommend you do. You know, try doing something off your own effort with children. So take something that you find the hardest, the most annoying, the thing that riles you up the most. And you choose and say, okay, I'm going to act in a loving manner from what I've heard and I'm not going to shout, get angry or, um, you know, do anything violent to that child. And see how hard it is. See how hard it is just to think it and then go and try and do that. Because I can guarantee that, it, that it, at some point you want to, you will desperately want to, if not do what you've always done. The other option is to actually look at the cause of why you feel it's okay to, you know, yell, scream, be angry, why even the behavior is happening. And you need to look at yourself about what attraction is going on or what you have allowed in your family. Like, you know, for me, I didn't say no, there was there was never a no. And even when I said no, my no, there wasn't a feeling of like, no, that's not okay. I just let the children do whatever they wanted. So that means that over a period of time, they felt entitled to do whatever they wanted. And when I said no, they would either then ask me again a few minutes later, or they'd just literally go and do it. And it was very interesting. I asked them as they got a little bit older, and I said, I said no, why did you still do it? And one of them said, I thought you said yes, mum. Because all they could hear was yes. <laughs> like they just, that feeling in me obviously was like, didn't even like, you know, do it. Then it became a point where they just wanted to do what they wanted to do and they were just taking that action. So we had to deal with that in a little bit of a different manner. My suggestion to you is to experiment anyway and try doing it intellectually 
and then have a go at really working through the issue. And that does take time. It does take effort. It does take a, um, a desire to really stick with it because it feels hard sometimes. It feels like you want to give up sometimes. It feels like you just want something to stop. And all of those things, like just let yourself feel and let yourself feel, let yourself feel, let yourself feel and go through the entire, you know, stages that you need to of feeling your emotions, whatever they are. Again, I really stress to do it in a self-responsible manner um, rather than taking it out on someone else, i.e. the children, you know. Most of the time we're already doing that in families. Now, some of you, I know I'm using examples like quite, um, you know, like, you know, hitting somebody or... Uh, you know, you might go, well, that never happens in my family. Our family is like so much more calm and, you know, there's, no, there's nothing happening and everything's all good. Well, I do make a suggestion that it is still worth uh, having a go at different things because often when things are calm or withdrawn or, you know, there's not, not so much engagement, there's still a whole lot of stuff going under the surface. But there's a facade and an expectation of how behavior needs to be in a family. So don't think that just because there's not like, you know, your kids aren't running wild or whatever, which for me, you know, because they were running wild, it was quite easy to see like when I actually made some shifts because things really changed and they actually calmed down a lot without me saying anything just by me making a soul shift. Or at the beginning, it was just by being very, very truthful about things. And that's the beauty and the power of truth is that it may, it just sorts a lot of things out very rapidly. But Yes, don't think just because your family is all nice on the surface that everything's okay. There will be a whole lot of things going on within the soul of each of you and depending on what's happened and the choices you've made and what kind of facade you have and what addictions you have will depend on what, how you react or cope with certain situations. And when I say cope, we can cope with far more than we think we can. So a lot of people get all worried about their emotions and feel they can't cope with them. And that's just a feeling that we need to go through and feel if that's the feeling you have. Work through that. Um, I've had to work through some of those emotions myself and it's just a feeling. Once you do it, like God never, it's a truth that God never gives us more than we can handle. The more overwhelmed you can let yourself be with your emotions, the better it's going to go. And so I suppose back to the, you know, the family who sort of seems perfect I've never met yet a perfect family and uh, often the illusion of perfection is hiding a whole lot of stuff underneath it that is, yeah, quite, um, uh, I know in my own family growing up, there was a, there was even like I have, I had a feeling of like I've got to do things perfectly before I do anything, like that was the feeling and it's not perfect from a, a loving, say God's perfection, which would be perfected in love. It was like, I've got to be perfect to look good and to, to seem like I'm like a, you know, a good person. And it was all a facade-based thing based on the family of, of not making the family look bad or not making the family, uh, making no waves in the family, just keeping it all nice. Now, you know, in, in both my immediate family and extended family, there's eating disorders, there's, you know, attempts at suicide, there's so much like rage that's not expressed because everything was suppressed and everything had to be nice. And if you were real angry, there was a really big feeling of like, no, you're not allowed to be angry. So everyone's just passively, aggressively in a rage. Not all the time, but there's a lot of anger in our family. And, you know, there's just different dynamics and ways that people deal with it. You know, expressing your sadness, um, speaking up about what was really happening in the family, all of those things are un unacceptable. And, that's still how I'm treated in my, my family. I started raising issues in my own family. And, you know, my parents don't want to deal with those issues. They've reacted in different ways towards me. The beauty of it for me is that in actually speaking up, being truthful, being honest, having the confrontation, one, it's helped me to work through a lot of feelings that I've had and release a lot of expectations and demands that I had on my own family. Two, it also highlighted to me what would have happened if I'd been a child and done the same things. And I can see why I didn't do certain things because I got severely punished and put down. And when I say severely punished, it wasn't necessarily physical violence, though sometimes that happened. Um, it was more emotional violence. It was more like ignoring me, ostracizing me, putting me on the outs until I came back around and towed the family line. And these are things that are worth looking at. So 
yeah, in these presentations, I want to try and cover as many different exam examples as possible because a lot of the time there's a lot going, well, I can't even say a lot of the time, all the time there is so much going on in any relationship. And that means between partners, between friends, between, you know, children. And sometimes we think, oh, well, we get on so well with our children or we get on so well with our partner. And, you know, some areas, yeah, you, there's really lovely connections and you, you get on really good and there's some really lovely things that can happen. You know, there's, there's often lovely things that happen in relationships. But sometimes when we think we get on so well, we're in total codependence with each other. And by codependence, I'm speaking about like you basically totally agree on what's going on. And that's why it feels so good because you're like, oh, well, you know, I get what I want. He gets what he wants. We're so close. And I suggest that if you, one of you stops the codependence, you'll see what's really happening in your relationship. And you can just stop the codependence in one area. And I guarantee you won't necessarily, you won't see it as a smooth sailing anymore. Now, when I say that, it can be smooth sailing again. It's just that anything out of harmony with love needs to be broken down. And that's what God's laws are trying to do. And codependence is not loving. Even though you might think it is, it's not. Codependence is not, it's just, it's not. It's out of harmony with love and it needs to be broken down. Once it is, then you can have an equal relationship. Um, you know, codependence is where one party's filling in the gaps of the other party. And I remember I've said a number of times, like, you know, I felt like, you know, with my ex-husband, I felt like, well, we work so well together because I fill in the gaps that he doesn't do and he fills in the gaps that I don't want to do. Like, so as a physical thing, he did outside work. I looked after the house. Not very well at the beginning, but better as we, we um, worked through a few things. Um, you know, wow, that's fantastic. But it also skipped over a whole lot of things of emotions that I have about working outside of beliefs and demands I have on a man that they need to do physical work and that I do like sort of more of the looking after the children and the looking after the home and all those things and highlighted that how much, you know, my ex-husband didn't want to do some of those things and wanted to leave certain parts of the, what happened with the children for me to deal with and the home for me to deal with. And when I didn't clean up and stuff, he'd get very angry. And when he didn't do certain things that I thought he should do, you know, I got very angry. So this is a way, again, I refer back to when we're talking about truth and transparency and what's really happening in your soul. These are some of those things to discover and become sensitive to and become more real and more honest about. There's going to be conflict if you engage this process with yourself and your own belief systems, um, possibly with others, depending on their level of humility and depending on if they want to work on themselves or not as well. Change your relationship to conflict. Conflict is going to happen when error is confronted. It's a natural part of becoming a more loving, more ethical, more moral person. So get used to it. Work through your reasons why you find it so uncomfortable. Now when I'm talking about conflict, conflict doesn't have to be a massive, violent, you know, fest. You can have like, you know, a, a what, a heated debate if you like without harming another person. You're allowed to be emotional and expressive. If you feel uncomfortable with that, then work through the reasons why you feel uncomfortable about it. And also, each if you're being emotionally responsible and you're actually taking responsibility for your own growth and progression, you're going to also be very honest about your intentions and motivations. Because if your intention is to have a conflict and to pull the other person down, well, now you're out of harmony with love. If your intention is just to find the truth and there's you know that calling conflict, well, then it's more loving intention. So we do need to become sensitive also to our motivations and intentions. And often we want to say things to ourselves and, uh, to reinforce we're good people or we're doing the right thing, but often we're a bit sneaky and our intentions aren't all that loving or all that kind or that nice or, you know, whatever other word you want to use. Becoming very, very real about what your real motivations and intentions are is a very important thing to do. So in summary, we've discussed um, ethics and morality and just given a brief definition and some brief examples about that. Ethics, the definition was acting in harmony with natural love of all humans, treat others as you would like to be treated, taking into consideration love of self, others, creatures and the natural environment. Ethics, 
creates equality between humans. So that was our definition of ethics. We're saying that's the starting point if you feel a bit clueless about how to measure what's loving and what's not loving. It's a place to start. Then we talked about morality, which is treating others, ourselves, and all of creation in harmony with God's love. Morality is a standard or code which helps us understand what is good and evil, loving and unloving from God's perspective. And I spoke about how having a relationship with God is essential in order to really understand and feel what is moral and what is not, because it's from God's perspective. So in short, sometimes when I refer to them, I'll probably refer to as ethics, as treating others as you'd like to be treated, that's ethics. And morality is treating others um, in a loving way from God's perspective. So is it as God would love? And that's how I suppose I short-termed it for myself, as I was like, is this loving, like, is, am I loving as God would love? Do I love, I like, and that was a lot of my prayer was, I, or I could say to God, God, I'd like to love as you love. And that would then bring in all of these attraction events that I'd become more open to seeing. They were already happening, but I'd become more sensitive to actually seeing and acknowledging. And they where I could see where I was out of harmony with love, um, which was very helpful for me. And I find a lot of my prayers end up that way as I end up praying for something and I see all the areas where it's not happening. <laughs> and that's exceptionally helpful because then you can work through things and it becomes more transparent. Also mentioned codependence and breaking down anything that's unloving in a relationship in order that then you can like build it up and create it into something that is based on love and has a foundation of love. And I feel that, you know, if your children are really young, I really encourage you to begin now. Like I suggest that with my whole heart, <laughs> the earlier you begin, the easier it is. Though you might not feel that in the moment as you're doing, you know, you're going through the first stages of this, it becomes far more easier later on. Because if what you deal with when the children are very young, you don't have to then deal with as they get older. And once they get, you know, pretty set and, and firm in their own addictions, now it's their choice of what they're going to do. And it, you know, it's just a compensation that I, for me, I didn't do it early enough. And I didn't, I was, I was, to be honest, selfish in that I didn't want to deal with certain things within myself. And due to my selfish desire, I have ended up that the children now have some very firmly entrenched addictions and they're acting on those, they're making decisions out of those, they want to do those. And so I'm paying the compensation for not having loved in the first place. All I can do is deal with my own feelings, clear out my own feelings, and also address those issues of love in the family. So when they happen, you know, for instance, when something happens with the children, we have a discussion about it, I raise it, I talk about the issue of love, and then I say, well, you know, what are you going to do about that? And then they make a choice. Sometimes they say they want to, but their actions show they don't. I then need to make a choice of, well, what am I going to do about that? And often I take an action in order to help them to see the pain and suffering that they are um, happening, like is happening in their lives, often just by reflecting back to them certain events that are happening in their lives, they can see that. But, you know, when something is affecting, say, other people in the household, then I need to make, um, ensure that, every, that love for all is upheld. And that sometimes means like restricting a child. And as they've gotten older, sometimes that means that they go to their own area in the house so that they don't have interactions with people for a certain time until they make you know, a different decision or until they choose to, um, yeah, to sort of reflect more on those things. Now, yeah, I sort of get creative now as they're getting older because I also am respecting that things have happened and they now have a choice of what they want to do. And sometimes I feel a bit helpless about that, um, but that's just an emotion I need to go through. And once I get through that, often, and often if I just feel some of that emotion, I come up with different ideas and I get more of a clarity about what is and what is not loving. That brings me to the conclusion of this presentation on just a brief introduction to ethics and morality. For more information and extensive discussion on ethics and morality, I suggest going to the Divine Truth channel, www.divinetruth.com, and checking out the, the, the talk on, on ethics and morality specifically in that. There's also talks on God's laws, on God and the universe and having a relationship with God. And there's some assistance group material which I highly recommend and it is about gaining an education in love. 
So um, if you want to head over for more information of that, I'll put, you can access it via the Divine Truth website. There'll also be some links underneath this to this specifically to the ethics and morality talk. So you can get more information if you want. The reason for having this just introduction is that, as I said, there's certain terminology and things that I'm going to be referring to in the presentations following this that are to do with ethics and about, you know, the main focus is on becoming a more loving person. Ethics is a simple way to begin that process. And then, you know, if you want a relationship with God, then you can actually become moral and learn about morality as well from a soul-based perspective. Um, that means in your soul as a feeling rather than just thinking about it or as an intellectual pursuit. And that is a process of development that will happen if you choose to engage, you know, God's way of becoming a more loving, um, truthful being in the world. I have found that it's been an excellent go-to with ethics and morality and this video is just to define what I am specifically speaking of so there's no uh, doubt or other interpretation of what I'm saying. I really want to be really clear about what I mean and what I'm speaking about so that it's not you know just the world's definition and you're thinking you understand what I'm saying. So that's why the definition of ethics and morality has been shared on this video. And in, in, in summary again, or basically, tr ethics, treating others as you'd like to be treated, morality, loving others as God loves, like from God's perspective. And I'm saying loving others, it also covers, you know, yourself, the environment, um, other creatures, everything. So it can apply to all kinds of things. So even if you don't have children or you, you're not interested in people, you can also apply it to animals and, you know, the, the uh, universe at large as well and learn more about love in those areas. All right, so that's the end of this little presentation on ethics and morality, and um, I'll see you in the next presentation.